Welcome to Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We're so glad you've joined us today. In Paul's letter to the Colossians, he declares that Jesus holds everything together, from the majestic to the microscopic and everything in between, work and family, friendships and faith. In this series, Pastor Skip explores the practical application of Jesus' preeminence so we can make sure that Jesus is at the center of it all. Always only Jesus, You might be in different parts of the country or the world, but you're connecting with us. Reach out to us and tell us who you are and uh, maybe start a connect group in your area with other believers. But we're in the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 3 and part of chapter 4, one verse of chapter 4. So let's turn in our Bibles uh, and get ready for that. Next to your home and the hours that you spend in your home, You spend most of your time, probably, if you're in that age group of working, you probably spend it at a workplace, a place of employment. Um, Most people do. They will spend half of their waking hours at a job site of some kind, a third of the day spent in work. If you live to be 70, and I sincerely hope you live to be more than that, but if you live to be 70 years of age, you will, by the age of 70, have spent 20 solid years in work. 20 years. Not only is that a chunk of time, but society largely defines people by what they do. Usually when we meet somebody and we get past, uh, what is your name? Probably the second or third question in the lineup is, what do you do? And somebody will then give you their occupation. I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I'm an accountant, uh, I own a business, whatever it might be. And uh, typically in uh, people's phones or in people's records, and you look at phone numbers, you have home phone and work phone. Now it's like cell phone for both of them, but typically it's divided by home and then by work. There is a dignity to work because we discover by reading our Bibles that work was actually God's idea from the beginning. God, the creator who himself, the Bible says, worked for six days and then rested on the seventh. One of the first things he did is give to man a job. In Genesis, it says that he took the man and put him in the garden to tend it, to work it. Now, I did a whole series on that some time back, the theology and ethics of working and resting. So that is not the point of this. The point of the text we're about to read here is what does a transformed life look like? What does a changed life, a transformed life look like? Paul has been speaking in very practical terms about the new you, the new man, he calls it. Uh, the, The old man versus the new man. The old man, put off the old man, put on the new man, put on tender mercies, put on humility, put on long suffering, put on love. And then he goes into the home and now the workplace. So we talk a lot about life change. Well, what does that really look like? Well, according to Paul, if you're a woman and you're a wife in a relationship, you become a new wife. If you're a husband in a relationship with a wife, you become a new husband. If you're a child in a home, you become a new child. If you're a parent in a home, you become a new kind of parent. And I've had so many people say, my husband is so different now that he has become a Christian. And I've had husbands say, my wife is now so different now that she has become a Christian. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, now let me tell you what a servant looks like in the workplace and what a master looks like in that work environment. 
Here is a transformed life. And this is an important concept just to get our minds around because uh, we here in the West, especially evangelicals, really love this term. We've used it a lot. I use it a lot. The term is a personal relationship with God or a personal relationship with Christ. I'm all for that. But we have taken that to almost mean an individualized, without accountability relationship with God. In other words, it's all about me. It's all about my personal peace and my love and my joy, and I'm now satisfied. In reality, what Paul points out by this is the new you impacts society. The transformed life gets out into the culture and begins to transform the environment. We become, as Jesus put it, salt and light. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. He said, a city set upon a hill cannot be hid. And one of the best hills to set your light on to make a difference is in the workplace. Now, I just want to press this point a little further before we get into these. And there's just a few verses. But did you know that most social reforms within Western culture are a direct result of transformed people through the gospel? Once people got saved and serious about their salvation, they went to transform their environment, the workplace. I have several examples. I just want to brush through them. When Christianity began to spread west, that is, it started in the Middle East, Jerusalem, started moving across Asia Minor, by the fourth century, the first institution called a hospital came into being, a direct result of Christians who took seriously Jesus' mandate to care for the sick. That happened in the fourth century in Cappadocia. Moving on a little bit further into more modern times, by the 1700s, the 18th century, there was a fiery preacher in England by the name of John Wesley. Ever hear him? He was a great preacher. But did you know that not only did he preach the gospel, but he preached against slavery. He preached for prison reform. He preached the education of people. And a great awakening happened, not only in England, but it spilled over into America. And when it came to America in the 1730s and 40s, the result was the building of great institutions of learning. Let's educate people. Let's bring learning to people. Back in England, a politician who was saved, a Christian politician by the name of William Wilberforce, led a movement. The movement was, let's abolish the slave trade. And in 1834, it was abolished in England. That spilled over then into America. And Christian leaders, especially among the Quakers, preached. One Quaker, one preacher said, slavery is the greatest sin against God. And a Quaker woman started a group called the American Anti-Slavery Society that culminated in President Lincoln signing the Emancipation of Proclamation in 1863. Back over in Germany, in Europe, there was a Lutheran minister by the name of Theodore Fliedner. And this minister built homes for ex-prisoners, sort of like halfway houses to get them back on their feet, Hospitals for the sick, asylums for the mentally ill, orphanages for kids. And one of his most famous students was a woman by the name of Florence Nightingale, who was called the mother of modern nursing. In the 19th century, now the 1800s, a man by the name of Lord Shaftesbury, he was actually the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, that's a title, his name was Anthony Ashley Cooper, got involved in the British Parliament to pass laws regulating child labor. 
Also in 1800s London, because the working conditions were so poor, because of the Industrial Revolution, people were working in cramped spaces and breathing in fumes, and, and people's lives were just miserable. So out of that, somebody had an idea. Let's start an organization, and we'll call it the YMCA, the Young Men's Christians Association, and also the YWCA, Young Women's Christian Association, to help alleviate the burden and stress. During that time, a missionary by the name of William Carey left from Britain to India, and while he was in India, not only did he preach, not only did he teach the Bible, but he lobbied to abolish widow burning. That was a thing then. Widow burning and child sacrifice. Also during that time, David Livingstone and many other missionaries followed him to Africa to discourage not only polygamy, but to fight slavery, as well as preach the gospel. And by the way, to bring it up to very modern times, probably the only ones really standing against the unthinkable slaughter of 20 million babies in this country because of abortion are Christians. I know it's a controversial subject nowadays, but that's only because what the Bible says would happen has happened, that the love of many will grow cold and people's consciences will be seared as with a hot iron. It's only the Christian church that is saying, that's wrong. That's murderous. So that is the result of being salt and light. Now, what I'd like to do in these verses, and I know we haven't even read these verses yet, but we're going to look at five verses. We're going to begin in chapter 3, verse 22, and take it all the way down to chapter 4, verse 1. And we're going to look at three basic aspects of the Christian faith in the workplace. This is the attitude of employees and employers. But I want to begin with the, the problem of enslavement. The problem of enslavement. And I'll show you why as we go through it. But let's now read our text, shall we? Verse 22, bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven." Now, after reading that, I just want to talk about the elephant in the room, the awkward topic of slavery in the Bible. And I bring it up because everybody I talk to who's not a Christian brings it up. And you don't have to really look far, but in verse 22, it uses the term bond servants, the Greek word douloi, better translation, slaves. He's writing to slaves. And then in verse 1 of chapter 4, masters, it's the word kurioi, lords, that is a slave owner or a slave master. So it brings up the question, why is Paul regulating slavery? Why doesn't Paul seek to abolish slavery? Now let me begin this question by first saying, slavery is wrong. There's no justification for it at all. Slavery is wrong, and the Bible sees it as such. It's a, against the very concept of redemption. The idea of redemption is to set a slave free by paying a price. Every year, the Jews celebrate Passover, have for generations. Passover celebrates being set free. They were once slaves to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and God set them free. However, people will say, yeah, but in the Old Testament, under Judaism, there was a form of slavery. So you guys keep bringing up the Bible this and the Bible that, and slavery's in the Bible. Now, people who say that really don't understand what the Bible says about it. So let me enlighten you. 
There was a certain kind of slavery among Jews in the Old Testament, but it was never forced. It was voluntary. If you had to pay off a debt, you would become a servant. You basically would enter into a contractual agreement to work for somebody to pay off their debt. But the Bible also highly regulated that relationship. So Exodus chapter 21 says if you mistreat a slave, and let's say he loses his eye or he loses a tooth, you have to let him go free. Deuteronomy 23 says you shall not oppress somebody that's in that contractual agreement. So if a slave leaves because he feels he's being abused and runs away and comes to your house, you have to let him in. And you can't turn him back over to his previous owner because of that mistreatment. Also in Exodus chapter 21, every seven years, all the slaves went free and all the debts were canceled. And at that point, the servant slave, the indentured servant, could have an option to make it a permanent relationship. He would go to his master and say, you know, I really love you. I love working with you. I love working for you. And I want to be permanently under your care and serve you forever. And and they would take his ear to the door of that tabernacle and they would punch a hole in it with an awl. And he would be permanently a servant. But that's Old Testament. We're dealing with the New Testament, and the slavery we're dealing with is the slavery going on among the Romans and the Greeks, and it was cruel, and it was abusive. There was nothing really kind about it. Did you know that the idea of slavery came from Roman ideology? The Romans just sort of thought that uh, it's beneath the dignity of a Roman citizen to to work. It's beneath the dignity of a Roman citizen to to, to get his hands dirty. That's manual labor is for slaves. Our life is about watching games and partying. Sort of like college. (laughs) Aristotle, the philosopher, the Greek philosopher said, a slave is nothing more than a living tool and a tool is an inanimate slave. The Roman noble statesman Varro, Marcus Varro, said the only thing distinguishing a slave from a beast or a cart is that a slave can't talk. And one Roman writer recommended that the only way to buy a farm is to toss out the old slaves to die because they're just broken tools, and most did exactly that. In Roman law, if a slave ran away from a slave owner and they caught him, they would brand a huge F for fugitivus on his forehead. And he would have to bear that for life, and often that meant death without trial. So that's the world of the New Testament. That's Roman imperialism and the slave system that was around it. So if that's true then, why didn't the apostles, including Paul the apostle, campaign against it? Why not sign petitions around the Roman Empire? Why not tell slaves to get up in arms and picket and and overrun the Roman government? Let me give you three quick reasons. Number one, because slavery was so much a part of the social fabric of the Roman Empire, it had predated Christianity by hundreds of years, by centuries. And in the Roman Empire, there was as many as one out of every three people that were slaves. Some scholars say up to 40%, 40% of all the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. In some cities, there were many times more slaves than there were free people. Now, who were slaves? Doctors were slaves. Musicians, teachers, artists, librarians, and accountants. J.B. Caird said, ancient society was as economically dependent on slavery as modern society is on machinery. So that's just number one. It was just what was part of the culture, and no one is going to change that quickly. Number two, 
Second reason, Christians in that culture were a tiny little minority. They had no political power whatsoever. They didn't vote for politicians like we do. That's an enormous power. They didn't have that power. I'm sure if they had that power, they would vote for people that, that uh, supported biblical values, but they had no power. For them to rebel would be seen as subversive. If Paul would have told all the slaves, rebel, uh, that would have created uh, a slave uprising, and the Roman government would violently have oppressed that, and very, very quickly. Then what would happen is the message of the gospel would have been confused for just some social program, just a social gospel. And then number three, and I think here is the most compelling reason why Paul didn't do anything, is that the system is never the issue. The heart is always the issue. You want to change things? Change people's hearts. Don't just change the external things. You know, you can have the right system with the wrong people. You can have the wrong system with the right people. You can abolish slavery in favor of democracy, but if you have corrupt people running it, you're just going to have a different kind of oppression. If you have a free enterprise system like we have in America, and you've got workers' rights and HR departments and government regulations and time off for every conceivable reason, but you have godless people running it and a godless boss giving you orders, it's just another kind of slavery. And Paul knew that. Paul knew that the problem is not political, the problem is not social, the problem is not civil, the problem is spiritual. So instead of trying to like overcome the politics of the day with the Roman Empire, he thought, I'm going to undermine the ideology of slavery by changing the hearts of the slave and the master. I'm going to get at their hearts. Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. What's he talking about? The church. In the church, there's no distinctions. There may be in the workplace, but not in the church. So the New Testament taught principles, listen carefully, that eventually would undermine slavery and abolish it. And by the second century, there were already so many people coming to Christ that slavery as an institution in the Roman Empire was already beginning to crumble. So that's the elephant in the room. That's the problem of enslavement. But let's expand this. That's the immediate context. Let's extend this to the employee-employer relationship, which brings me to the second aspect, and that is the priorities of employment. Now, the text says this. Bond servants obey in all things your masters. Let's throw in the word employers. According to the flesh, not with eye service, not as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do when you're at work, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, not to your boss. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there is no partiality. Now, in just reading that, and there's not a whole lot here, but there are some characteristics that every Christian worker should have. And the first characteristic is obedience. Obedience. Again, the text says, bond servants, or again, employees, obey your masters according to the flesh. Now, that's an important distinction. They were only their masters according to the flesh. When they were under the supervision of the master and paying off the debt, or under the Roman, even if it was a abusive and oppressive, they're only the master of the flesh, not the master of the spirit does not imply any intellectual superiority or that that person is better. It's merely a physical relationship. Now, here's a problem that is happening. If you have slaves in this system becoming Christians and you have oppressive 
masters that was very prevalent in the Greco-Roman culture. So now you got these slaves becoming Christians. So for the first time, they're feeling elevated. They're standing up straighter. Their heads are, are, are lifted up. And they're thinking, I'm a child of God. I'm royalty. I'm going to rule and reign with Christ one day. Why am I obeying this knucklehead? I'm a new person. If they would have rebelled in that system, that would have destroyed their Christian testimony. So Paul says, now that you're saved, you're called to a higher standard. Be a model slave. Be a model servant. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Okay, we who work, we who are hired by a company, we who sign a contract with any organization, we too are called to obey. When we go to work, when we work for the company, that company owns your time. It's only according to the flesh. They don't own all your time. They don't own your thoughts, but they own your time. And you might think, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm at this job so I can preach the gospel. Good, good. I hope you do. But that's not all you're called to do. And I bring this up because I work in a hospital. I worked in radiology for years. And I remember this one intern who was a young Christian, not, a, not an intern, he was uh, an orderly, excuse me. So he would get the patients and bring them down uh, to our department. And uh, he was a young believer, very zealous. But he was always late and never brought patients down on time. And so I cordoned him off one day, and I said, can I just ask you a question? Of all the orderlies here, you are always late. He goes, yeah, but God's given me opportunity to preach to these people. I'm sharing the gospel with them. I said, I'm glad you are, but do it on your own time. Clock out, and when you're on your own time, go back up to the room and share all you want. But when you're on this hospital's clock, you go get the patients and bring them down on time because that's what they're asking you to do. You see, frankly, uh, nobody's really going to listen to what you have to say unless you have a commitment to work. How you work will often determine what people think about God. So obey. Obedience, that's the, that's the first part. Second, diligence. Diligence. Look at verse 22. Bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, looking around to see if the boss is looking, as men pleasers, you know, saying all the right things to butter him or her up, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, verse 23, do it heartily, energetically. Listen, you ought to be the best worker your company has simply simply because you are a Christian. That would be your best witness. Now, after this little incident with this orderly, um, I traveled overseas, came back, got a job at a different hospital in Orange County, and I remember going for the interview, and uh, I was one of several people they were interviewing, and, and, and after my interview, the boss said, thanks, we'll call you. You know, I, I, I know what a brush off is, so I knew that he's going to see 20, 30 applicants and make a decision. So I was about to leave the room, but I came back and I said, before I leave, I just want to say one thing. If you hire me, I will be the best worker in this department that you have. And he sat up, looked at me like, nobody's ever said that to me before. And he said, put the application, and he said, you're hired. Well, now I had to perform, right? I just made a promise. Now my neck's on the line. So for the next weeks and months and years, I had to live up to that promise. But diligence goes a long way. Did you know that workers in America admit, this is research that is done, workers in America admit that they spend over 20% of their time at work goofing off. You know what 20% is? That's a whole day in a work week. A whole day. You know, there's emails and there's Instagram and there's, you know, important things to do. 
So obedience, diligence. Third is reverence. Look at verse 22. It says, well, you do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So you got a boss. The boss has given you grief and given you orders. Do it as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, whenever you do this, whenever you decide, I'm going to do my job as I'm doing it, like I would be, I'm employed by God as unto the Lord, you are going to turn, it's, it's transformational, by the way, guaranteed. It takes menial tasks and makes them noble tasks. I'm doing this paperwork for Jesus. I'm doing this unsavory job for Jesus. I'm going to do it because this would please the Lord. It is transformational. It makes menial tasks and turns them into noble tasks. By the way, let's just destroy this myth that has been going around for a long time, and that is sacred versus secular. You may have heard that term. Well, this is my sacred life over here. I go to church and I do these things. And then the, here's my secular life. Ain't no difference. To be perfectly literate in English, ain't no difference. So what, what Paul is saying, your sacred life should be transferred to your secular environment. One and the same. One and the same. Now, um, maybe you're uh, thinking, Skip, you know, you, you can preach on this all, all you want, but you work at a church and you work around Christians. And b besides that, you don't know my boss. My boss is tough. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Listen to this. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Servants, servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, that is reverence, respect. Be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Word means crooked, perverse. Got any, any, I'm not going to ask you a show of hands. <laughs> Ever worked for somebody like that? I have. I worked in a different hospital, and my direct supervisor knew I was a Christian and tried on purpose every chance she got to make my life miserable. I would come in, and I'd be whistling or singing a song. It was Monday morning, and she goes, nobody sings on Monday. Nobody should be allowed to sing on Monday. I go, I do. She tried really hard to be oppressive. I had one of these bosses. And then uh, years before that, when I worked on a farm in Israel, and it was already hard work. It was backbreaking, boring work. It wasn't what I was used to. It was not mentally stimulating. It was just grunt work. You know, I'm just kind of doing whatever they tell me to do. One of my friends who was with me from America on this farm, this kibbutz, had the bright idea. Well, let's, he said, let's all of us American volunteers, Christian volunteers, let's volunteer for the worst jobs on the kibbutz. He knew Passover was coming up, and every Passover they uh, export chickens to different people around the land. And so the kibbutz asks people to, on top of their normal responsibilities, to come volunteer and work for no pay and losing two, a few hours of sleep. It, it's from about midnight to two in the morning to work putting chickens in crates and exporting. It is nasty work if you've ever worked in that environment. But he just thought, let's do that. Let's all sign up. And so we all did. And I'll tell you what, I had to think, this is to the Lord, this is to the Lord, this is for the Lord, this is for Jesus, with every stinking chicken I grabbed. <laughs> it's the only thing that got me through. But you know what happened at the end of all that, because these Jewish people knew that we were young Christians from America, and they came to us after it was all said and done. They said, we'd like to meet with you guys. We have never seen Americans like you. We always thought Americans are soft and weak and they don't want to do hard work. And here you guys signed up for the worst jobs. We know you have a faith in Jesus. We would like you to tell us what that is. They invited our testimony. They would not have unless Randy signed us up for working with the chickens. <laughs> so he did. Obedience, 
diligence, reverence, finally, patience. Patience. Well, well when am I going to get compensated? W when is somebody going to recognize me? Well, verse 24 tells you that. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. That's the positive. Now here's the negative. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he do has done, and there is no partiality. In other words, you have a job and a boss, and things aren't great. It's boring. They're not recognizing you. You're not getting paid enough. You're overworked. You're underpaid. That's just right now. Isn't it a comfort? I hope it is that God keeps track of all that and will reward you. There'll be an e eternal compensation coming your way. He's going to settle accounts. I've always loved the story about the missionaries, husband and wife, they went to Africa. They had gotten old. They were coming back to the United States, and they boarded a ship to come back to New York Harbor. Aboard the ship coming back from Africa to the States was President Theodore Roosevelt. He had been in Africa also, but not as a missionary, obviously. He had been in Africa with his gun, hunting big game. Just for a few days, shot a few animals, was coming home. He's on the boat, pulls into New York Harbor, tons of people in New York Harbor, fanfare, confetti, welcoming the president, not the missionary, the president home. You know, clapping, bands playing, president comes off. The couple goes to a cheap hotel room that night, and the old man says, it's just not right. We give our lives to save souls in the jungles of Africa, we have poured out ourselves. We have been spent. We, we come home and get nothing. This guy comes home and he gets fanfare. And his wife put her hand on his shoulder and said, Sweetheart, we're not home yet. We're not home yet. Now, when you get home, I bet the reward in heaven is going to be far better than any raise on earth or any promotion that you got or didn't get, much greater. So patience, obedience, diligence, reverence, patience. So we have two aspects. Problem of enslavement, what was really going on in the New Testament era. The priorities of employment for those of us who work. And then third, the professional environment. And this is to the master. Verse 1 of chapter 4, and we'll close here. Masters. Give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Single sentence, simple directive. That's the employer's task. What is it? He is to provide an environment, a professional environment that is equitable, impartial, and fair. Equitable marketplace, impartial workplace. You see, according to Paul, when in this relationship of slave and master 2,000 years ago, if a master got saved, he has just placed a master above him. When a slave owner gets saved, he has just said, there is another will higher than my will that I must please and look after. That, that's a change. See, before, before his salvation, he was the boss. Before his salvation, the buck stopped with him. No longer, says Paul. You also have a master. Every master, every slave master in the New Testament who got saved was a slave of Christ. Romans 6, 22. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. 
Now, as I wrap this up, there's just a couple things you should know. I mentioned that by New Testament times, as the Christian gospel kept penetrating, that slavery became less and less. Roman policy eventually relaxed. Rome realized that having happy slaves, contented slaves, they were more productive. They started treating treating them more leniently. Masters even taught slaves a trade and in some cases became close friends with their slaves. And then after a period of time, the Roman Senate granted slaves who were accused of crimes a right to a fair trial, and eventually it was abolished altogether. Quick question. What if a slave and a lord, a master, both get saved? Right? That's ideal, you would think. That's ideal. That's awesome. Because you're going to be in church and there's, there's a no uh, male, no female, no slave, no free. We're all one in Christ. Yes, but that will have its own kind of possible problems as well. Just in the same way it would have a problem today. Here's the problem. I think, my, my boss is a believer. And so am I. That means I can relax a little bit around him or her. That means um, I'm working for a Christian because I'm working for a Christian, a brother. I can work a little bit less because I don't have to worry about my testimony. He's already saved. He's already a Christian. We're brothers. We can just sit around, have coffee, and discuss things. No. Put in a full day's hard work. Because doesn't it follow that if you, according to Paul, are going to serve somebody who isn't your brother in Christ, that you would certainly serve somebody who is your brother in Christ? So, put it all together, because we're leaving this section for good. A new man, a new you, a new man makes a new home. And a new man makes a new work environment. Now, if all of us had the attitude that we studied in this few verses, it would be a powerful, and I'll even say shocking, testimony to an unsaved world. It would go a long, long way. I want to close with something from the second century. Justin Martyr, one of the early church fathers, wrote that, There were many people that were coming in contact with Christians, transformed men and women, the Christian church. And he says, and we'll put this on the screen, they were changed from violent, by their interaction, changed from violent, tyrannical characters, either from having watched their Christian neighbors or from having observed the wonderful patience of Christian travelers when they were overcharged or, or, from just doing business with Christians. People were transformed by just contacting at a professional level, doing business with Christians. So here's my challenge to all of us. Let your work be the means by which you offer yourself to God to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Say that again. Let your work be the means by which you offer yourself to God to reach a world for Jesus Christ. In fact, I'm going to say it again a third time. Third time is a charm. Let your work be the means by which you offer yourself to God to reach the world for Jesus Christ. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Our Father, uh, we are speaking to you, the creator, the one who worked for six days in, in making the world that we live in, the one who gave to the first man a job in the garden. But we're speaking to you not just as our creator, but as our father, one who redeemed us from the slavery of sin, And you want us to treat 
uh, people with respect and with love and with deference and with compassion, with care. And so, Lord, those of us who find ourselves under the employ of of, uh, a company or a business, a man or a woman who is a supervisor, in some cases, he or she is very difficult to work with. And uh, we're, we're scheming all sorts of ways to get out of that. Lord, I just pray we would take a fresh look at it. And by our obedience and by our diligence in doing our job heartily, wholeheartedly, by our reverence, realizing I'm doing it as unto God, it's, it's that I'm serving Christ, and by our patience, we're going to get a promotion. We're going to get a reward, an eternal compensation of some kind for just being faithful. I pray that would carry us through. I pray it would be transforming to us. And I pray, Lord, for those who are in a boss's seat, the employer's chair, and they're making decisions, and they're creating an environment. I pray that it would be equitable and impartial, filled with love and care for those who work with us. Lord, this is very real stuff because this is what we do for many more hours than coming to church for an hour and 20 minutes. So Lord, I pray that you would do a deep work in us and by our lives, by what we produce, uh, we would put the light high that all may see it. The light The city set upon a hill, pray would not be hidden, but it would be illuminating and transforming. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church. We would love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email mystory at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.